Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Professor Cox, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here uh, this evening. Um, as you gathered from what Professor Cox um, said in the title of this lecture, what I'd like to do today is to, um, or this evening, is to talk about parasites and introduce you to parasites, which I think are a remarkable set of animals, uh, but they're usually animals that aren't particularly seen, and, but I think they're wor very worthwhile seeing because they are interesting and they also have very important effects uh, on us and other animals. And I think Professor Cox also made an important distinction. I don't particularly want to talk about the disease, what these parasites do to hosts. I want to talk about these as, as organisms in their own right, to talk about their biology. I think if there's one thing you, know, you take away from this lecture this evening, it's to remember that parasites are everywhere, and they're absolutely a normal thing for most animals, and indeed, uh, until recent times, for most people to have. Parasites are a normal thing. Um, what I did, don't want you to think of is you're going to take away parasites tonight, because that might say something about Gresham's uh, plumbing, which I'm sure is uh, top class. So perhaps we should um, start at the, the, um, the beginning and just to try and define what a parasite is. Uh, the original uh, definition or the original meaning of the word parasite was it was an organism, or someone rather, uh, living at the table uh, with an, another individual. And that immediately gets us perhaps to the part of the heart of a, a parasite. There are, the difficulty in thinking about associations between different organisms is there are many types of associations between different organisms. So there's commensalism, there's symbiosis, there's mutualism, but there's also parasitism. And the defining feature of parasites, organisms that are parasites, is that they cause some harm to their host. And this is the, from the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, the, the definition that is a, a pretty good uh, first definition of a parasite. And in these other interactions between uh, organisms, mutualism, symbiosis, and, and commensalism, uh, there's a shared interaction between those organisms so that the host does at least as well from the interaction as the interacting organism. But in parasitism, the parasite is causing harm to the host. So it's causing harm is the defining feature of organisms uh, that are parasites. Now, I said to you, the one thing I'd like you to remember is parasites are everywhere, they're highly abundant, uh, and they're a normal part of, um, of life for other organisms. And if we jump ahead for a moment, um, I just want to just sh uh, show you that by thinking about uh, some types of parasites that we'll come back to in more detail later on. But I just want to get across this, the feature of the abundance and the ubiquity of parasites. If we look at this, this map of the, uh, of, of the world, this shows the distribution of worm infections in people. And I'm showing it at people because the data are quite good. And what this shows here is, this is a type of worm which causes a soil transmitted worm. We'll come back to some detail about that in a moment. But these are very common in the tropics. There's probably about a billion people today on the planet that have got worms in their belly. And these are mainly young people and poor people of the developing world. They're hugely abundant organisms. If we look in more detail just at Africa, just to show how common these are, this is, this is the colour coding here is showing the, um, the proportion of people that are infected with those worms in their belly. And you see where the colour is dark purple. This is where more than 50% of individuals in those areas have worms in their belly. Lots of the grey is probably where there's no data, but again, in sub-Saharan Africa, worms are very, very common in people's bellies. Of course, these types of infections overlap with other types of parasites. Here's another map of the, uh, of the planet. And the dark green is showing where malaria infection, it's another parasite we'll look at briefly, also occurs. So what you see is that people are living in the tropics here. They will typically have uh, worms in their bellies, and they'll typically have parasites in their blood as well. So two types of parasites. And again, the idea I want to get across to you is that when hosts are infected with parasites, they have many different types of parasites in their bodies and on their bodies. So there's a community of organisms living on and other organisms. Another way of looking at the uh, ubiquity of parasitism is a rem rather remarkable study that was done in Southern California in this rather unremarkable salt marsh just next to this uh, freeway, this uh, Carpinteria uh, salt marsh. And what this study looked at was try to measure the total amount of parasitism that existed in all the animals that lived in that rather unremarkable salt marsh. And what these people did, they went and the zoologists, they went and took the, took the system to apart, and they, ma they measured the mass of the parasites, the total amount of parasites in that uh, salt marsh. 
The total biomass in that salt, mash, salt marsh is equivalent to the mass of about 10 elephants. Okay? Now, you really would notice 10 elephants on that salt marsh, but you actually don't see unless you go looking for the parasites. These parasites have a very high reproductive capacity, and the reproductive capacity is the equivalent of producing one or two baby elephants every day for 200 days of the year. So there's this huge amount of biology, parasitism, going on in these environments, but most of the time we just don't see it. So they're everywhere, and they're an important part of our lives and, the, and of the natural world around us. OK, so let's come back to our definition of parasites. So we're thinking about these organisms that live with, uh, with hosts and cause harm to those hosts. What I'm thinking about for hosts are things like us, mammals and reptiles and birds, amphibians, but also invertebrates, things like insects, mollusks, slugs and snails and so on. I'm thinking about organisms that live with those organisms as hosts and cause harm. Now, there are lots of things that live with other organisms that cause harm. There are viruses, obviously, which give you coughs and sneezes. HIV and Ebola is, um, flu are also viruses. There's bacteria that give you um, a food poisoning. These are, are organisms that cause harm, but they're typically studied by microbiologists, and so not by parasitologists. The things that are studied by parasitologists are other animals that live with host animals. And there are two types of, uh, two broad classes of parasites, there's single-celled animals, which are the protozoa, and then there's the multicellular animals, which are the metazoa, or these, or these worms. I'm much more interested in worms. I'm going to spend most of the time we have together talking about worms, because I think they're, um, they're probably something many of you haven't seen and they're worth talking about. But I will just briefly talk about some of the single-celled parasites uh, that live in animals. Here's one we've met already. It causes uh, malaria. Its Latin name is Plasmodium. And this is a single-celled animal that in the, the human host lives inside the red blood cell. Uh, it re reproduces inside the red blood cell. It bursts out of the red blood cell, as this one is doing here. Here you can see the parasites in the red blood cell. And, of course, it's transmitted through insects uh, to come back to infect hosts. So this is an animal that's infecting another animal. Common in people, but there are many other types of malaria in non-human animals as well. Okay. Another one you might have heard of is uh, the causative agent of sleeping sickness. Uh, this is the parasite here in blue. It's not really blue, this is a false colour. But again, it's a single-celled animal. In Latin, it's trypanosoma. Here you can see it on top of the red blood cells. It lives free in the blood. Again, it's also transmitted by insects. These are single-celled animals whose home is the blood system of organisms like us. Okay, so these are the, the um, protozoa, one big class of parasites. What I'm more interested in, as I said, are worms. Now, you might think all worms look the same, and I'd forgive you for that, but actually to people who are interested in worms, there's lots of different types of worms. There's particularly, the, the, with respect to parasites, there's flatworms, the, um, the platyhelminths, and there's the roundworms, the nematodes. The type of worm you're probably familiar with is the garden worm. That's an annelid, a segmented worm. Uh, but segmented worms don't make parasites. So we're going to look at flatworms and roundworms. So let's just start with the flatworms. Rather a lovely group of animals um, uh, called the, pla the platyhelminths in Latin. Now, one type of flatworm is called a, um, a planaria. They're free living. This is what they look like. And if you go with a keen eye, perhaps with a hand lens into a pond, you'll find these things crawling around here. They are flat, as the name uh, suggests. Some of them are quite large like this, but many are small. Uh, they've got a couple of eye spots here, and they just appear to glide over the surface. What they're quite famous for is their regenerative ability. So if you, in many species, if you cut the head off here, they'll manage to regrow a head. Uh, in fact, Darwin did quite a lot of experiments in cutting these and seeing how they grow. So these are non-parasitic uh, types of uh, flatworms. Now, one type of parasitic flatworm, uh, there's three types of parasitic flatworm, flat, flatworm. Uh, one type of, uh, is, this is an example, one type of parasitic flatworm are called monogenean uh, flatworms, and that's because they have one host in their life cycle. This one has the rather wonderful name of Diplozoon paradoxum. These live typically on the outside of their host, and this parasite here lives on the gills of fish. And it's a remarkable worm, because what this is actually is two worms, and when they were young, they came together, 
And to mate, what they've done is they've grown into each other and they've plumbed their reproductive systems into each other. And if you look at this drawing here, uh, which is of one of these, it shows all these tubes now interact. Each worm is a hermaphrodite, so each has got a male and a female system, reproductive system, and they've plumbed themselves in so that they're permanently having sexual reproduction, okay, to produce eggs. These live on the gills of fish, and here this is what a worm looks like in, in flesh. It looks like a cross, very easy to see. Um, so this is a type of parasitic flatworm. This will sit here, laying eggs, the eggs drift off into the water, and those make larval worms which come back to get back onto the gills of the fish. The harm this worm is doing to its host is it's, it's taking blood uh, from the gills of the fish. Okay, so that's one type of uh, parasitic flatworm. Here's another type, it's called a digenean um, uh, flatworm because it has two hosts in its life cycle. One host is always a snail and the other is an animal like us or some other mammal or bird. This is an example of an infection in humans. It's called schistosoma in uh, Latin. Uh, the, the disease in humans is called bilharzia. And these are the worms which normally live in the blood vessels of their host. They'll live in the blood vessels that are attached to the, uh, the intestines of the host. And these are male and female worms as well. Worms need to reproduce. And what these two worms do is they live as a permanent cu couple. They live in a permanent state of copulation. And the thinner worm here in the middle is the female worm, and it's permanently grasped by the, uh, by the male worm who holds her, but is also permanently inseminating her. And this is the worm here, this is the female, held by this bigger male here. It lives in the blood vessels, it produces eggs. These eggs have spines on them, and those will either tear through from the blood vessel into the intestine or from the blood vessel into the bladder so that those eggs can then get out in the faeces or in the urine outside of the host. And then larval stages infect snails, and there's reproduction within the snails, and larval stages come out of those snails ready to infect a host. So a highly complex life cycle for what one might think of as an otherwise rather similar, a simple organism. Of course, these eggs are being produced in the blood system. A lot of them end up in the liver. They get trapped there. So a lot of the disease of Bilharzia is liver disease because of these eggs being trapped in the liver of the host. That's the harm that these parasites can cause. Okay. So that's the second type of flatworm we thought about. There's a third type, which are the tapeworms, or more formally known as uh, cestodes. This is an example of a cestode, a tapeworm. So this is the head end of the worm here, and this is what its anterior end looks like. The colour is false. It would normally just be a pale-looking thing. It lives in the intestine of its host, and it holds on to the intestine of its host with this ring of hooks here and these four suckers, one, two, three, and there's one behind. It holds on to the, to the uh, high up in the intestine, and then its body will grow, as you can see, for quite some considerable distance along the length the person's gut. Now these are remarkable worms. They're highly evolved, highly adapted to being a parasite, because in their evolutionary history they've lost their intestine. These animals have no mouth and they have no gut, because they're living in the intestine, they're surrounded by the host's food, and they just absorb food directly from the host through the worm's surface. They no longer have any need for a gut. And that's the harm these cestos, these tapeworms, are causing to their host. They're taking some of the nutrient that the host would otherwise have for itself. These worms are a, a series of segments. They're zoologically not proper segments. Uh, but each one of these little bits, each one of these little tapes of, these, uh, of this worm is, its, again, its own reproductive unit, a little capsule. And again, that's reproductive. That's a hermaphrodite. It's got male and female reproductive structures. So they can self-fertilise, they can cross-fertilise with other worms. And each little bit of the worm, once it fertilises, grows eggs within it. And as we go down the length of the worm, these segments are becoming more and more mature, so they get more and more well-developed eggs as we go down the worm. And right at the end, these little segments drop off. They're in the intestine, they come out of the host in the faeces, so there are eggs then outside of the host, ready to infect a new host. And so the cycle continues. So all of this, again, this huge worm here, it's all about reproduction to make stages to infect new hosts. <laughs>
Okay, so that's a very, very, uh, it's a whistle-stop tour of some of the parasites, the single-celled protozoa and some of the flatworms, the platyhelminths. But what I want to talk about are nematodes, which are my favourite type of parasitic worm. These are some examples of, of the head ends of uh, parasitic worms and some whole worms as well. Now, nematodes are a remarkable group of animals. They are round worms, uh, and they're the most abundant and speciose group of animals that exist on the planet today. Okay? There's more species of nematode there, than there are of insects, than there are of arthropods. But you've probably never seen one because most of them are very small, and the bigger ones are parasites. Rather beautifully, Nathan Cobb, in 1914, wrote this in an article, which I'll very briefly read, and it says, In short, if all the matter in the universe except the nematodes were swept away, our world will still be dimly recognisable. We should find its mountains, hills, vales, rivers, lakes and oceans represented by a film of nematodes, because many nematodes are free-living as well. The location of towns would be decipherable, since for human beings there would be corresponding massing of certain nematodes because they're parasites. Trees would still stand in ghostly rows representing our streets and highways. The location of various plants and animals would still be decipherable. It's absolutely true. Wherever you look, there are nematodes. They're free living, they parasitize animals, and they parasitize plants. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce you to them if you haven't met them before. What I would like to do is talk about um, parasitic worms. And what I thought I would do is uh, perhaps introduce you to a few of them, but then think about some of the challenges of being a parasitic uh, worm. So this is the worm I want to talk about, and I brought one along to show you as well. Uh, this is, uh, I brought it because it's a big one, um, and I'm only putting a glove on because the preservative's not very nice. The worm's very, very dead. This worm is called Ascaris lumbricoides, and there's a big bunch of them on the left here. And this is, this is one of them. Okay. So this is a female worm that's come, actually come from the gut of a, a pig, but there's essentially identical species uh, in people as well. It's a very big worm by nematode standards, and I bought it because it's a big one. This is a female, and it's, it's just full of reproductive tissue. The male is very slightly smaller. Uh, but if you have an infection of Ascaris, as many kids uh, in Africa will, you will have these uh, in your small intestine, just behind your stomach. And what the picture on the... Um, what I'm going to do, I don't thought what to do with that function. Put it away. And if you cut that worm in half and look inside it, which is uh, what we've got here, so this is a, tr a section through the worm, all of that red bit is the reproductive structures of the worms. That's ovaries and uteri. They have two ovaries and two uteri to make about... so that they can lay about 200,000... Uh, eggs a day, which is over 100 eggs a minute. So these are reproductive factories living in the guts of their hosts. <coughs> and this is the, what these are making. This is the egg of these worms. So these worms live in the intestine of their host. They're reproductive. They produce 200,000 of these eggs today. And perhaps you can get the sense that it's got a big, thick shell around it. And these eggs will then go into the environment with the faeces from the host. And because they've got this protective coat here, uh, they will persist in the environment for a long time. They'll resist, resist being dried out, uh, being rained on, and so on and so forth. And they'll just lie around contaminating the environment until accidentally a, another host uh, eats those eggs by a faecal oral contamination and then the life cycle continues. It's a remarkable life cycle. It doesn't make any sense at all if you think about it. But let's look at this. So here the egg is coming out of this worm, uh, sorry, out of the infective host here. And unfortunately somebody um, has a contamination event. They infect themselves. So this, work, this egg then will go through the stomach. It survives the stomach because of the thick shell. It gets into the small intestine. And you might think, well, actually, that's where it wants to live. You know, it's got to where it needs to get back to. It's got back to the gut. Uh, but it doesn't do that. It goes on a, it goes on a wonder, a wonder, a wonder lust. So the egg hatches to make a larval form, and then it burrows out of the gut into the blood system, and it travels in the blood system to the lungs, and then it penetrates from the blood side into the air sac side of the lung. So it's in the, air, the, lung, uh, the lung air spaces, then it's coughed up in the sputum that we all make in our lungs. 
That is then swallowed with the larva, so it's back in the gut. So these worms come into the host, they do migration through the lungs to get back to the gut. And the whole time they're migrating, they're feeding and they're growing, so that when they get back to the gut, they're of quite a large worm. And that size gives them this very high reproductive capacity. This is, for a nematode, this is quite an average life cycle. This complexity, this interesting within host migration is quite common among parasitic nematodes. Could I just ask, I don't wish to embarrass one, has anybody here uh, knowingly had worms? Oh. Okay, there's a few of us, we're all in the front row, or a few perhaps. Okay. Well, I, I hate to tell you, I suspect most people in the room have had worms because we probably all had this worm. Okay. We probably all share a little uh, guilty secret. Probably when we were a child, we might have been in bed one night, and we might have had an incredibly itchy anus. And if you're like me, you probably scratched that. And probably what happened, what was happening there was you had these worms, called pinworms, Enterobus vermicularis. They live low down in the gut, and at night, the female worm sticks her back end out of your back end to lay eggs, and that's very itchy and you'd have scratched that, and the eggs would have got under your fingernail, and then, of course, that ends up in your, in your, um, in your mouth, and the cycle continues. These are very common in children today, uh, pinworm. Of course, we shouldn't be embarrassed about this guilty secret, because when you were a, a child in bed, probably scratching your bottom, probably your brothers and sisters were doing exactly the same thing, because if there's an infection in the house, probably everyone has got the infection as well. So we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. There's also a very nice story about uh, these worms, it's called Enterobis vermicularis. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a, a, a parasitologist at the Natural History Museum in France whose son, uh, Gregor, had pinworms. And Dad, being a proper parasitologist, uh, collected some of worms from his son and looked at them very carefully. And in doing so, found a second species of pinworm in his son, which he then named after his son. So there's two species of <laughs> Enterobis vermicularis as well. So I don't know whether that's a good thing to be famous for, but, but there one goes. We also perhaps shouldn't be embarrassed about having worms because we share worms with uh, famous people. Uh, if you look in the in mummified um, uh, pharaohs, and indeed in the remains of Richard III, famously found in uh, Leicester quite recently, uh, because of, in pharaohs there are uh, well-preserved bodies, and indeed some of the intestines, or, or where the intestines were, were preserved in Richard III, and indeed in many other bodies that are found. In fact, probably some of these recent excavations in the city here as well. You'll find these eggs uh, in these people, uh, which are of a parasite which is called Trichurus in Latin, or whipworm. They're a very distinctive egg. They've got this flat end at each side. And these, these eggs, whipworm eggs, are common in, in mummies. Uh, Richard III had them as well. Uh, many bodies one finds from, from historic times have them. Um, and that just shows the ubiquity of parasites in days gone by, they were shared by people at the top of society as well. These worms are called whipworms because their back end is thick and then leads to a very thin uh, anterior end. So you can imagine that's a bit like the handle, the back end of the worm. And what these worms do, their anterior end, they stick it into the, into the uh, gut of the host and feed. And the back end sticks out, just pumping out eggs. Uh, Richard III and many other bodies, uh, pharaohs have, have these uh, whipworms, uh, but they also have asterisks, the, the big thing I spoke about as well. They're very commonly there. And we see those because these eggs are so resistant, they are pr preserved in these uh, remains in various ways. Okay. So that's, a, again, a very brief introduction to some of, some of the worms. But I thought what we might try and do is perhaps try and get our head into what's going on in these worms. What is it like to be a parasite? Because we live a nice life, uh, you know, it's a bit chilly today, but, you know, we're living in a nice, sensible, warm environment. We know the environment we live in. And it's a little bit hard to imagine what the world, the experience would be like for a worm that's living in the gut of an animal. And we know for other nematodes, this is a free-living nematode, so one of these free-living species that Cobb was talking about that lives absolutely everywhere. It's here it's living on an agar surface, an artificial surface in a lab. Again, all of that black is uh, its eggs. It's going to lay most of, most of invertebrate animals are always eggs. I'll just show you that again. And this worm has been very intensively studied since the 1970s. And remarkably, it just consists of about a thousand cells excluding its reproductive organs. So it's somatic tissue, it's non-reproductive organ or uh, non-reproductive tissue, 
is about 1,000 cells. And about a third of those cells, about 300, are nerve cells. And it has a little sort of brain. It's a collection of nerve cells just around its neck. Um, and so this worm obviously doesn't have consciousness, but it does have a controlling system. So, but for the moment, what I'd like to do with worms is to, is to give them some consciousness, give them some thought, so we can think about what it might think, be thinking when it's trying to be a parasite. Just in passing, I'll say this worm again. I'll just show you one, one more time. It's got about um, uh, 20,000 genes. So it's got more genes than an insect, a very well-known insect thing called Drosophila, it's about 17,000 genes. We've probably got about 30, perhaps 35,000 genes. So this simple worm, much like some of these parasites in its genetic content, uh, actually is very sophisticated genetically. Or to put it another way, there isn't a huge gap genetically between these animals uh, and ourselves. So let's put ourselves, try and put ourselves into the mind of this parasitic worm here and see what sort of life it leads. Okay, well, what sort of home does this um, animal have? We've also already met that briefly. So what does it think about its home? Well, its home is the intestine of animals like us. This is the small intestine of a, a, a human. And what this worm might be thinking, well, I've got actually, I live in this space, which is normally filled, uh, normally filled with mashed up food that the host is eating. But of course, what the worm will, won't know about this space is it's actually several metres long. But if it'll live just in one very small space, it'll know there's a, there's a whole load of land, shall we say, upstream, there's a whole load of land downstream, but it'll never know it. All these worms we're, we're thinking about here have a very specific part of the intestine in which they live. They stick to their local patch. Now here, we've got a central space which is full of food, and then we've got this fuzzy layer here, which are the villi, and if we cut this and look, um, and, and look through it with a light microscope here, uh, these are the villi projections into the, uh, the lumen of the gut, this being the lumen here. And some, so some parasites, this ascaris thing, it's living in the space in the, in the, middle, of the, uh, in the middle of the intestine. This is a picture of the gut that's been emptied of food, uh, of host foods. You can see the worm. And this is an ascaris in situ here. Okay? And of course, in some cases, there'll be many of these worms in one individual. But other worms actually don't live in the lumen. They live in this villus layer here. And if you think about that, that actually is pretty deep. You could certainly hide a worm in that. And that must be some way, perhaps living like in a, in a deep bit of forest. And some worms that live in the villi are things that are called uh, hookworms. They're a type of nematode again. They're a bit smaller. They're about that big. If you look at their, their mouth end, they've got these rather nicely uh, cutting plates. And that's because the way they make their living uh, is that they bite into the host, they bite into these villi here, and they take blood from that host. They're called hookworms. There are two uh, species uh, in, in humans, and they're called hookworms because they hook onto their host. And here we have a little look. So endoscopy here, and this is the worm here, this little white wiggle here. So it's much, much smaller than this. And it's attaching at the, its head end here with those plates. It's cutting on to the host tissue. It's biting onto one of those villi. And here's a little spurt of blood because it's made a wound. We'll see some more in a minute. And there's a little bleed, okay, because it's made a little wound. So what it's feeding off, it's feeding off the host blood. That's the harm it's doing. And it probably lives quite a different life than this ascaris worm. This ascaris, great big thing, it lies in the loom in the gut. It probably is just pumping in the host food all the time. It's just like a machine, you know, perhaps a tunneling machine, to take that food in to make all these eggs. Probably what these worms do, these hookworms do, is they probably feed perhaps once or twice a day. They take a little, you know, a belly full of blood, which is highly nutritious, will take some time to, to digest. Uh, they'll take some blood, they'll have some reproduction based on that, and they'll make, a mother, then make another reproductive effort after that. But if we just go back, uh, so that's two different environments already in the gut. We've got the worms that live in the lumen. We've got worms that live in this um, the, the villus layer here. But we've got worms that burrow in below the villi as well. And these are worms, actually my very favourite worms, uh, ones called Stromolodes, the ones that I work on. This is a, a, one of them here. It's only about one and a half millimetres long, about 50 thousandths of a millimetre 
in diameter, and it actually, even though it's an intestinal worm, it burrows below those villi. And this is tissue from an animal that's been infected with the worms that's then been sectioned, cut into section and looked at with microscope. And the worms are these dark things here. And what you see around them are the tunnel this worm builds. It actually produces molecules with which it lines the tunnel. Remember when they built the channel tunnel, they had that machine that went under the tunnel, and as it went, it lined it with concrete or something to, to stop it falling in. Sort of what these worms are doing. They're burrowing into the tissue, and they're spitting out molecules which seem to form this in slightly, somewhat impervious layer around the, the, themselves as they go. Probably so they can make their own microenvironment, but also perhaps to protect themselves from the host immune response. So don't wish to keep going back. But just to say what that means, therefore, in this intestine is we've got lots of different places, not just parasites of the gut. It's a couple of metres long, and worms will live in very different places because the physiology and how it feels is very different on parts of the gut. But on this little place, in this little section here, we've got a space in the middle where the biology and the feeding opportunities are very different. The ones that live in the villi here, the, the hookworms that feed on the blood, and the worms that uh, burrow into the tissue underneath. So this is actually, the gut is a rich and diverse um, uh, environment in which these worms uh, can live. Okay. Okay, so what does our worm that's living in the gut think? What does it think about what it sees around itself? Well, it's going to see lots of food and mashed up uh, with the host is eaten. That's mainly going to be bacteria. There's a vast quantity of bacteria in this environment. So watch this worm's normal environment, this worm's normal environment, is a huge quantity of bacteria. It might see some other uh, protozoan parasites. There's something called Giardia, which is a, a, a single-celled animal that also lives in the gut. It might come across those. Of course, it might also come across other worms as well. It might come across some of its own kind. These worms are male and female, so if you're a male worm, you need to find a female, and vice versa. And actually, it might go from being very often by itself to sometimes being a very crowded environment. Because what worms typically have is what's called an over-dispersed distribution. And I apologise for showing you a graph, but let's try and explain this. This is The way to think about this is the 20-80 rule. 20% 20 of the hosts, let's imagine you're a population of hosts here, 20% of you might have 80% of the parasites. Okay? Rather curious distribution. So here, this is how many worms there are in an individual host. So here we've got lots of hosts that haven't got any worms at all. They're uninfected. And we've got some hosts here that have just got one worm. That's quite common as well. Quite a lot of hosts have got just two worms. That's quite common as well. Okay, so lots of hosts don't have got none or very few worms. But out here we've got a very small number of hosts which have a very large number of parasites, a very large number of worms. This is called an over-dispersed distribution. And it's absolutely typical of nematode, or of worm parasites, I should say, that the distribution of the parasites across a host population isn't even, even. it's clumped. Most of the parasites are a minority of the hosts. So what that means for this worm is, um, some if it's down here, it'll be a very crowded environment. There'll be lots of worms clumped into that host, and its life will be rather different because of it. But if it's here, it's going to be by itself, if it's, by, if it's here by itself, it's not going to be able to reproduce, and that will be an evolutionary uh, dead end for itself. Okay. Now, the other consequence of this over-dispersed distribution when these worms are in this very crowded environment is that worms and parasites, as all organisms, suffer what's called density-dependent effects. They do less well when they're in a high-density environment. And the way of thinking about that is um, a competition at a buffet. Imagine you're at a wedding and there's a buffet... Uh, if there's not very many guests and there's a large buffet, everyone gets lots to eat. If there's an awful lot of people fighting over the buffet, everyone does less well. These are density-dependent effects. All animals suffer from them, and parasites do as well. Just look at this uh, graph here, which is showing a density-dependent effect on how the worms can reproduce. So it's saying for each worm, how many eggs can that worm produce, depending on how many worms are in the host. And what one sees is this line isn't horizontal, it actually declines. So for every worm by itself, how reproductively successful it can be depends on how many other worms it is with. And if it's with a lot of other worms, it does much less well. So there's a disadvantage in 
being in the presence of lots of other parasites because you're less successful yourself. So these density-dependent effects are very important in um, parasite infections. So this worm, let's go back to this worm in its gut. So it's living in this great big gut, but it's got its own niche. There's lots of other different types of worms around, uh, but with respect to its own species, there might be lots of its own species or very few, uh, and it needs to have some to be able to reproduce, but if there's lots of other worms there, then its reproduction is compromised because those worms are competing over the food, just like a free-living uh, ecosystem. I just said, though, this worm in its environment might have other species of worm there, and these worms, just as in a free-living ecosystem, they will interact as well. Sometimes the worms have positive effects on each other, sometimes they have negative effects on each other. I just want to show you one example uh, of an experiment where um, people looked at how two types of worms, uh, one called Hemonchus contortus and one called Trichostrongus colubriformis, which are natural parasites of sheep, uh, interact when, you, um, when they occur together inside a host. Uh, this happens in nature, but what, what we can show you here is an experiment done in sheep in Australia. And the experiment was to take some sheep experimentally and to give some of those sheep just one species of parasite, so species A, another species B, and in the third group of sheep, you gave those, those uh, sheep both species of parasites. And you ask how the worms did when there are other species of parasite with them. You ask how they interact. And let's look at that for this worm here. So here, this is as an infection lasts. So a sheep is infected back here at day zero and then what follows the sheep until the worms get going. And here, for this type of sheep, we're asking how many worms are in the sheep, because they've been given a certain number. And when the worms are by themselves, what one finds is that there's some number of worms at the beginning, it increases a few days, a few, uh, days later or weeks later, then slowly the number of worms decline. That's probably because the host is making an immune response against the worm and killing them. But if those sheep, identically in other way, in every other way, have a second species of worm, the one, the one on, on the previous slide, then in this setting, those same, this same species of worm does that much better. So the press of the second species of worm helps the infection of the first species of worm. Okay, so there's a synergistic effect between these two species. And probably what's going on here is this, uh, the second species of worm, which isn't on the slide, is actually altering the immune response of the host so that the first species of parasite can do that much better. Okay. So this is a positive interaction between these worms. Of course, there can be negative interactions. The point I'm trying to make is these worms aren't living independent lives within the gut where they're living here. They're interacting with themselves, their own species, but also different species of worms, just as you would imagine in a free-living environment. Now, parasites have been around a very long time, from well, the dawn of our species and actually since multicellular animals came to be. So the host immune response uh, has, the, yeah, the host immune response, the host immune system has evolved in the presence of parasites. Now, parasites can be harmed by the host immune response. And so if we think about what this worm, it's living in the gut, and even though it's living in the space in the gut, it's still exposed to the host immune response. The host makes an immune response, and it'll spit out cells and molecules into the loom of the gut to try and harm these worms. For worms that are feeding off the blood, then they're taking in that blood of the host directly, which will have molecules the host, is made, the host uh, has made to try and harm the parasites. So we can ask if this parasite is sitting in its gut, in the gut of its host, rather, it's being attacked by the host immune response, and that's, going to, that's hard work for these worms. Typically what it'll make these worms do is it makes them shrink um, because they, they um, can't feed as well. The worm I worked on, uh, the worm I mentioned earlier, the thing called Strongyloides, it's about two and a half millimetres long. If there's a host immune response, it'll halve its length and it'll stop reproducing. That's what the host immune response does. If you remove the host immune response, then the worms get big and reproductive again. So a crucial part of these worms' environment is the host immune response. And of course, they haven't been passive partners during their evolution because the host immune response harms them. So what most of these worms evolved to do is to immunomodulate the host. They've evolved to change the host immune response 
for their own benefit. <coughs> and what they do is they release molecules uh, from themselves which directly interact with molecules of the host immune response, our molecules, to turn down the immune response or to change the immune response so that these worms uh, do better. And we can see this in this graph here. If we just plot uh, a graph of uh, what the immune response will look like uh, as a worm infection is acquired by a host, so a host gets a new infection, and the host immune response increases because the host is trying to get rid of the worm. But as the infection goes on, as the infection becomes chronic because the worms are continuing to live there, one sees that the host immune response declines. And it's declining not because the host is choosing not to make an immune response, perhaps I should put choosing in quotes, but it's declining because the worms are producing molecules that turn down the immune response. They're interfering with the host immune response. They're interfering with what the host can do. They're manipulating the host for their own benefit. And you can see this as well experimentally because if you um, measure how hosts make responses to other molecules unrelated to the worms, one sees that also declines. So this turning down of the immune response by the worms affects all types of immune response that people will see. And for example, I don't know a, a great amount of detail here, but in individuals uh, in the developing world which have got um, substantial worm infections, for example, their response to vaccination can be reduced because vaccination is an immunological response and the worms are changing the ability of those infected individuals to respond to the vaccination. Now we, as indeed all animals, have evolved with worms in our bellies and so our immune response has evolved in the presence of these parasites and these effects. And this has a consequence for when the worms are no longer present because the, what is the usual environment for the host immune response, worms in belly, is no longer present. Most of us haven't got worms in our belly, so we're living uh, a very unusual life, unusual evolutionarily, because all of our evolutionary history, for thousands and millions of generations, there have been worms in our bellies. And our immune system, rather oddly, probably for only two or three generations, has been worm-free. And the immune system, uh, with respect to infections, has two types of flavours. Uh, it's rather unhelpfully called a T-help, one type immune response, but a red response, a uh, blue type response, a T-help, two response. And this is basically to think of flavours of immune response. They're acting against pathogens, but they're different flavours of immune response. And this, the red one here typically acts against bacteria and viruses. It's a, 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 an inflammatory response. And this other one here, this, this blue one, this T-help, two type response, typically works against big things like worms. But this sort of immune response is also responsible for allergies. If any of you have hay fever, you're having a T helper 2 type immune response when you have that. Now, you may have heard of the hygiene hypothesis, and there's two aspects to that. So the hygiene hypothesis is trying to explain why allergies have got so common, particularly in the developed West, particularly in the recent uh, generation or so. And there are two interrelated uh, reasons for that. One is we're living much cleaner lives now, so we are exposed to far fewer bacteria and viruses, particularly when we're children. And as a consequence, we make far fewer of these immune responses than we would have done historically. And the consequence is we make rather more T helper 2 type immune responses, which are allergy type responses. So we're slightly more predisposed to allergies because we live cleaner lives. But the other part of this explanation is our immune system grew up, evolved, in the presence of these worms that were turning down the immune response, and now these worms have been removed. So that, that usual suppression has been removed. So again, we also get some more of this inflammatory type uh, reaction, uh, sorry, this um, allergy-type reaction. So worms have helped mould evolutionarily our immune system, and in their absence, some uh, less than desirable things go on, which we probably see as allergies. Let's come back to this worm because we've been thinking about it living in the gut, but of course it actually leads a double life. It's living in the gut, it's living with other worms, it's feeding, uh, it's worrying about how many other worms about it, it's around it, uh, it's worrying about the host immune response, but of course it spends a lot of its life also outside of the host. It produces the eggs that have to live outside the host uh, for some period of time. The temperature here is a steady 37 degrees centigrade, here it's whatever the weather throws at it. This is a very stable environment, despite it having immune response, and here it's a very unstable environment, 
So these are remarkable animals, actually. They're having the free living life that we know, but actually then half their life is also inside a host. And indeed, what these animals seem to do is they seem to turn on and off. Uh, they have different genes. They'll turn them one set of genes on when they're inside the host. They live that sort of life. And outside of the host, in different stages, they'll then live a free living uh, a life as well. What evolutionary life about is about is producing offspring that go on to perpetuate oneself. And for parasites, what that is all about is transmission, getting to new hosts, because these are stuck in the, in the gut of, a, of a, an animal, and of course success means getting to other animals. And it's worth just thinking that every interaction we might see in the natural world, I know you won't see this in London, but you'll see it on the television, but any interaction you'll see of animals out there actually is also an example of a parasite transmission event. If we think about this, which are lions eating a, a, a gnu uh, in, in Africa somewhere, on these uh, hosts will have uh, parasites living on their surface. This is a, um, an arthropod here. They'll have parasites in their blood. These are the protozoa, and they'll have worms in their gut. But every one of these interactions we see in this little bit of biology here is a parasite transmission event, and most parasite transmission is around normal biological processes. So when this animal here was grazing, it was taking in worm parasites. These two animals being together are transmitting uh, ectoparasites from one to another. Uh, but this animal predating upon this animal is also infecting itself with parasites from here. So any interaction you can imagine between parasites, uh, sorry, between hosts, these could be animals you see outside, cats and mice you see outside, is actually a study in parasite transmission. And it's interesting to think about anything you might watch by David Attenborough, some wonderful uh, uh, film of the natural environment. What you never see there is always the parasites. The parasites are always being transmitted through all of that. Uh, biology. So as I close, I just hope you've, met, uh, you've enjoyed this very brief introduction to these worm parasites, uh, which are underneath every aspect of biology, every animal and plant uh, you might see out there. And so I hope you perhaps look at the natural world with a, uh, um, a deeper interest the next time you, you care to think about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.